Welcome to Dudes from Underground, your source to find consistent anarchist news on the internet. Today we are welcomed by a fellow returning co-host. Johnny Howie. And could you tell us a little bit of uh, I guess, stuff that you're into? Well, it's great to be back on your favorite uh, alternative media news source. Uh, I've been kind of in the mix uh, between new jobs uh, in the transportation field, transportation planning, and uh, traffic engineering, things like that. and uh, really gaining some traction in that and talking to a lot of professionals uh, as well as working with Phil here on some music putting, hopefully putting together a set for Anarchon so that's really uh, fun yeah it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, fun to be, it's great to be back thank you yeah I look forward to uh, you DJing the whole uh, festival yeah. <laughs> it was my first experience uh, no that was I great I really liked it yeah <laughs> so I guess uh, we'll start with the first story alright yeah so the first story we have today is uh, PRTC lost 1.5 million when hot lanes opened up on I-95. So this is kind of a, a local issue in Virginia, but it does apply across the country. New toll lanes on Interstates 95 and 395 brought more options to commuters when they opened one year ago. Single drivers can now pay toll and ride the lanes, whereas before, all vehicles had to have at least three occupants during peak times. Today, the toll lanes are monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all drivers must have an electronic RFID easy pass to use them. A vehicle with three or more occupants still rides free. The Potomac and Rappahannock Transportation Commission, PRTC, lost $1.5 million this year and state of good repair funding when the old HOV, high occupancy vehicle lanes, were converted to HOT, high occupancy toll lanes. Hmm. So, so I, I, how do they tell if you have three or more people and don't need to pay a toll? Is it actually a toll booth or is it just a transponder? I believe it's a camera technology where they, they'll take they'll basically take a picture of your car and they'll probably randomly you know check people to see who's violating. And I think they also have you know uh, police and other and. Uh, unmarked police cars kind of watching, watching. the uh, yeah probably the, the toll agencies themselves also I think it's uh, a privately um, operated uh, commission it's, there's one down here and uh, it's called the RMA the Richmond um, something hmm. uh, authority metropolitan authority who owns one of the toll lines so yeah there are there are some toll operating agencies that help the state manage the, those things um, but this is this is applicable to, applicable to every all, all states across the country. Uh, they they feel it's more efficient to open up the lanes to all users. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we've been operating on a system where transit agencies get special funding because most transit agencies across the country operate at a fifty percent deficit. Uh, so fifty percent of all their operating costs has to be subsidized, mm -hmm. and that's that's good. Like most of them are below that, so uh, they're losing these these uh, state of good repair funding from the federal government because the jurisdictions now have toll lanes. So, but but the, the there's this lag, right? There's lag time between uh, the jurisdictions giving the money and figuring out how to best fund the transit agency. So they made these decisions prematurely before they figured out how it's going to affect other services, hmm. you know, their multimodal transportation system. So. Uh, and that change went into effect across the country on January 15th, 2015. Uh, it couldn't come at a worse time because PRTC, the transit company, is already facing a $9 million budget shortfall. Uh, so they're looking for the, the counties to, to pitch in and pick up the tab. Uh, it's just another example of how lawmakers can't figure out, you know, a monopoly cannot figure out how to equitably, you know, run their business that right. they've forcefully taken over. That they, that it's so great to nationalize these kind of services. Um, and the 1.5 million is only grant funding loss, right? So we, we haven't even done the impact of opening up these new capacity, these lane capacity. We've, we've opened up three new lanes on a highway that used to only serve. serve uh, we, we have six lanes that now that where we only had three lanes before. Uh, so you're significantly expanding the number of volume of traffic of cars that can get through at a, at a certain period of time so if you can just drive there faster why take transit mm -hmm. so there's a lot of people are shifting to driving their cars again 
when the, and so the transit companies are losing, losing out big time. Mm-hmm. So we don't even know what the impact on ridership fares and revenues that this, this uh, agency has lost. And then of course, let us say it didn't succeed because we just didn't have enough money. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> and now imagine running your business that way. Like would you run your restaurant in that manner? Or if you even, you know, the guy in Detroit who runs the Fuller buses with the smartphones, I don't know. Yeah, he has very reliable, good service. Uh, bring your own beer, and uh, that's just one example. But just how would you would you operate at such a uh, inept way in your, of your own business? Maybe a little, but not to the tune of right. millions. Right? You have a lot to risk uh, as a as an owner of the business, right? Yeah. You could lose it all if you make a lot of stupid decisions, right? If your entrepreneurial skills is not up to par uh, in allocating those resources. Uh, but with government and the people in charge of here, it's like, they don't, they're not risking their own capital, they're not risking anything, they're still going to get paid, they're still going to get find another way to just deal with this kind of funding and get it there. Well, the incentives are actually opposite, because the, the more they, they run under, or they, the more they run over budget, rather, the more insufficient things are, the more they can rail for more funds. Right. It, it's, it's really kind of a, that's how boondoggles happen. Because, oh, uh, we screwed everything up because we are idiots. Uh, we need more money so that we can be smarter somehow. Yeah, I, I talked to a guy who was working on some of these roads up uh, on the interstate uh, a while ago and uh, did a lot of contract work and like uh, with them. I and mean, some of them were included like building some of these machines that they were using like, to tear up the gar- ground and, uh, and create some roads. And, but of course, like the state will say, yeah, we, we're going to need a new huge machine for this operation. And it's like, yeah, I mean, you're looking at you, you just got to replace this part. It's like, no, no, we need a whole new one. Yeah. Uh, we're not talking about replacing any tiny part, that would, of course, be more cost efficient. Mm-hmm. We need a whole new one, of course, to kind of substantially justify the budget, of course. Right. And what he told me is that uh, one of the, I think, Fort Lee out there on the base, that they would just bury uh, these vehicles out there underneath the ground. Uh, sometimes it's just to show like we don't know what happened to them as a as a way to kind of make it uh, disappear. Okay. And he was there just watching them just bury these these huge vehicles. Right. Um, yeah. Well, uh, imagine that. Who would have thought that being funneled money that's stolen would incentivize you to con people yeah. <laughs> to be dishonest <laughs> with the money? Oh. Huh. Yeah, there's a whole host of issues with with this. Uh, you know, you have the Easy Pass, so the kind of Big Brother watching you, like, and you know, some people who don't own a car or can't maybe, you know, don't want to even have RFID attached to their vehicles and being monitored constantly. Uh, there's the environmental issues. There's the spatial relationship, the spatial component of people still continuing this um, kind of urban sprawl kind of thing. And this isn't to to knock people that want to live in certain arrangements or drive a car, this is having a, a plethora of options, right, of, you know, to fit different people's needs who have different commuting um, patterns, right? right. So we, we don't want to all fund everything into interstate highways and cars and roads because we've seen where that's taken us. So we need to kind of spread the butter around a little bit more, so to speak. And, and, and I, I believe a free society would kind of do that naturally. Yeah, yeah. Cater to the needs and preferences changes all the time, and that's why the entrepreneurs are trying to figure out and match that. But government is like, well, here's the plan for, for eternity, <laughs> and you're stuck with it. Yeah. Like the roads around D.C., mm-hmm. uh, it's like NASCAR racing around there all the time. Yeah, and that's who this, this you know, this, this toll thing kind of affects mostly. This is kind of a Northern Virginia, D.C. area issue. Uh, but it, it's it's affecting all all over the parts all parts of the country. Mm-hmm. Well, this is uh, it's actually similar to something that they're doing in Orlando. So um, I actually before I came up here, I lived in Orlando, and, and what they're doing they they just recently started a plan to widen uh, Interstate Four, which is the the main the it's the only interstate that actually goes through Orlando. And what they're doing is they're adding they're wide they're expanding it and adding toll lanes for you know ex, quote unquote express lanes. Uh, which kind of makes sense when you look at it, you know, have add a paid incentive for for faster travel to sort of you know separate people from the from the main load. But what this is doing, it's like a it's like a it'll create a bottleneck least, down the road, or um, I, I'm sure it will. Um, but what what I'm saying is that this is this is like a five or ten year pro- project at least. I think it, I want to say it was actually fifteen years, mm-hmm. and 
everybody is just, everybody in town has looked at this and said, okay, next 15 years, I'm never going to ride on I-4 ever because you know it's going to be terrible because it's going to be on, under construction. It's mm -hmm. already, the reason why they're doing this is a, po is a, a, a post hoc uh, attack on the, the traffic issues that are already happening because they're, they're doing this because I-4 is terrible. Mm -hmm. It is notorious for being a terrible road to drive on in Orlando. And the thing is, if this was a, you know, if this was a private in, in infrastructure, one, it's not going to take them 5, 10, 15 years to finish this project. Uh, two, they would have probably seen this coming ahead of time because they would actually invest in, in some sort of intelli business intelligence mm -hmm. to know what, what kind of... Clearly, if you have one interstate going through the entire town, it's going to attract a lot of traffic, especially if you're right next to Disney World, mm -hmm. you have Universal Studios in the southwest of the, of the city. This is going to attract a lot of expansion in the, in the city, and you're going to attract, you know, you're going to attract a lot of traffic to the one uh, interstate that goes through. Right. So this is all stuff that should have happened, you know, this expansion project, the toll road project, these are things that should have happened a long time ago. They should have happened decades ago. But they're just now getting to it, and they're putting this entire this huge rut in in traffic in the middle of town, mm -hmm. so that people are. It, it's going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. Everybody expects it to be terrible, and everybody's complaining about it. Especially about during the construction when that stuff comes in. Exactly. Yeah, I find that to be like the most efficient use of time here, in which uh, they really can't uh, work outside any other time. It's kind of like uh, government mandated, and it's certain, these certain hours you have to do these work. So they can't do it in like uh, when peak traffic is over <laughs> or when like nobody's on the road here like especially here in 64 for a while for like a year uh they would do the construction uh during high peak volumes during the day not at night not at like three o'clock in the morning to be more efficient well i will say in the in the case of orlando I, I don't think they actually have those regulations i think they do because i regularly see a lot see workers out at night you mm -hmm. know working on roads when when there's a lot of construction so i think that that part at least is not going to be uh, quite quite that much of an issue, right. but at the same time, I mean, you have a main, the main uh, roadway, the main freeway in Orlando is going to be under construction for 15 years. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of great uh, studies out there right now. You can just kind of Google like induced demand road widening that show that widening roads don't actually improve traffic conditions because you're just inducing more drivers to drive that right. route, right? You're just inducing where people may have had other modes of transportation. You're just, then now they'll go and buy a car. And that's kind of what's been happening since the 30s, you know, 20s and 30s. And it's, it's a trend that, that is being induced through taxation. It's but not something that would naturally It stimulates aggregate demand. Hmm. Right. The, the, the problem that is you see look. Right. in terms of uh, like the high volume of traffic there is also a result of uh, the laws that prevent uh, density populations from building upwards toward the sky. So there's, uh, no, there's all, all sorts of alternatives that you can go to. Right. Um, your, your typical six lane highway is around eight million dollars per mile to construct. Uh, they have new systems like personal rapid transit. Um, you can Google that too as well. That very uh, low impact, um, very you know, efficient form of especially urban uh, travel uh, modes. There's there's maglevs. There's all, all sorts of new stuff that are coming out. There's even these like tube car looking things that are like the you know like the mail systems you know go through the the vacuum tube looking things that they're making in China. The Elon Elon Musk, Musk thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the hyperloop. Yeah. I mean, there's there's all sorts of things that would have probably already been out by now. Right. If oh. we hadn't completely gone all in into the interstate. The unseen. Right. <laughs> the unseen. Thanks. Uh, that was Eisenhower, wasn't it? That did yeah. the interstate. Good old fascist Dwight. Yeah. 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 Uh, if you want to talk about like, uh, the historic uh, Route 66, that song, uh, Nacton Cola sings about, uh, yeah. yeah, that would state all those uh, populations because there were yeah. no exit points uh, towards those cities. So economic productivity, they're starving and died out. Now you have all these ghost towns, relics of the past is frozen there. Well, uh, that happened here with Route 1. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. 
it, it was to transport tanks. Right. Right. It had nothing to do with transportation or helping people in terms of their mobility. They were fine. Yeah. This is only just okay to transport tanks and put down any, anybody who dares to rebel against the government. They need to move their forces around when they need to. Well, I had mentioned the environmental and the Big Brother. You know, there's also the, the, the taxation issue where uh, you can get more revenue from people if you have them move out to the suburbs and you can charge them property taxes on the number of cars and homes and things like that. If you, if you spread people out, you can get, you can milk more from them, mm. right? And they feel more secure because they have their little piece of land. You look like you're free range over Right, there. so it, it, it's not always, it's not always the best option. Mm. And, uh, that's just, I, I think people should be able to have more choice in their living and community patterns. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So the next story is uh, thousands of doctors walk out of England's hospitals in first strike in 40 years. Doctors across England walked out today in the first of three planned strikes over pay and working hours, causing hospital services to be severely disrupted. The strike by 38,000 junior doctors, qualified doctors that are not consultants or general practitioners, is the first of its kind in 40 years and means thousands of appointments and non-emergency operations have been canceled. Wow. Yeah, so this is, this is a strike over a, a proposed plan um, to cut what is called antisocial hours. So antisocial hours are effectively um, kind of like overtime or, uh, uh, no, well, not so much overtime uh, as the graveyard shift. So graveyard shift, um, work tends to be paid more than regular hours because nobody wants to work. Right. Well, except for weirdos like you and me, yeah. most people don't want to work at night. <laughs> so uh, graveyard shift tends to be paid more. Similar to, uh, to that, uh, antisocial hours are higher paid hours. And what this plan is doing is effectively saying, okay, uh, well, it, what it's doing is, is saying, now instead of seven to seven, uh, antisocial hours don't actually start until 10 p.m. Hmm. So now quote, what's called standard hours, which is standard pay, will go from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., which cuts pay for three hours out of the day. Right. Now, uh, this is being put in conjunction with a, uh, a slight pay raise, hourly pay raise, for the junior doctors. But um, all in all, it comes out actually negative to their pay. And the, the junior doctors like to, to, I don't know if there's actually a union involved in this or not, but they're, they're basically saying, oh, this isn't about our pay, this is about, you know, tired doctors, which is crap, you know. But at the same time, if I go to med school for four, you know, eight, or if I go to college for a combined eight years and then med school for however much, yeah. I want to get paid. I don't think that people are, you know, are entitled to my work. But, of course, we know that in England, under the, uh, um, I'm brain farting on the name, but under the healthcare system in England, this is, you know, people are entitled to other people's labor. Yeah. Uh, this kind of strikes with a lot of the problems here in the United States in which there's a limit, there's an actual limit in the amount of doctors that can be out there. Mm. And so, like, why are there not enough doctors out there for a lot of these uh, services out there? Or why are these uh, the costs so high? Also a transportation issue. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, if uh, you abolish these government arbitrary limits, you free up a lot of markets of doctors out there, which would come out through that competition, help the prices be lower, uh, which also now uh, helps them specialize in more interesting fields and sort of having to be kind of limited or like insurance companies now have to cover an entire list instead of having specialized insurance companies to to kind of target specific illnesses, mm -hmm. uh, which is why they're so costly today. Uh, mm -hmm. They're kind of forcing a mandate to cover a whole range. Mm -hmm. And so same thing with doctors. So you abolish these uh, arbitrary limit, you free up an abundance of, uh, of people entering that field. Mm -hmm. and they can now charge the services and go in the areas and what they have to do. And then you won't have any of these problems that's, that you can see as well that's going on in England. Right. Um, yeah, well, I mean, and it, one of the things that really bothers me about this is that the junior doctors actually feel like they have to they have to make this claim like oh we're not talking about money we're not talking about our pay why is that wrong you you should be able to demand a certain pay for your services i mean it's 
if you put that much work into actually developing this, there's nothing wrong with saying I should be paid for that. Right. And it's, it's absolutely despicable that we, to me at least, that we have this mindset that, oh, you're there to care for people. You shouldn't want a paycheck. You should right. be there to help. You should be there to you know, offer yourself in abundance to everybody else. Give, give of yourself. And don't think about your own well-being. They do the same thing with the uh, like organization that calls itself nonprofit organization. What is wrong with profit? Right, right. Yeah, uh, you're making it seem like oh no, we're not here to make profit. Profit is a good sign. It's a good measure of success. That things are growing, right? Uh, that things are evolving, uh, updating. There's nothing wrong with the word profit. And so, of course, in socialist countries like this, of course, yeah, they kind of want to stigmatize and make it kind of sound kind of negative, and forgetting that. No one will survive if nobody profits. When people trade, if they profit through that interaction. Or you could have, you know, like the old man doctors that, you know, would be in a small town and he, he wouldn't have to go through all these wretched accreditations and, uh, you know, he would kind of have the old school knowledge and he would be you know, a much more efficient means of, you know, uh, preventative medicine right before letting things get to a certain right. point well, that's that's the thing I mean we this this stuff has has happened historically all over you know in in the United States but that's illegal. there are cash doctors yeah. yeah I mean it's it's illegal in, in England I think now it's I illegal think it is illegal yeah. Here now. Yeah. yeah um but it's you know there there were there was a doctor that was uh, famous for basically just driving his his car to wherever whoever needed help and he would say, okay, you know, this is a minor thing, whatever, and I'll take care of it, take this, or, or, and he would take care of it, get paid in cash, everything was fine, everybody was happy. But, you know, now you have to have insurance to That's cover your, your GP visit, just right. a, re a regular checkup has to be, you know, through your insurance, and it's, it's mm. ridiculous. And this is supposed to be affordable, uh, affordable health care. We pat, you know, Obama put uh, shoved this thing down our throats. The affordable health care bill, health care uh, costs have have shot through the roof. Yeah. They have, if you actually, you can actually go go to um, Fred. It's the uh, it's the uh, um, uh, shoot, what is it, Missouri or yeah, the St. Louis Federal Reserve. You can actually look at health care costs, the uh, the CPI for health care, and you will see. The rising of healthcare costs since 2011 or 12, whenever it is that this this thing came through, and it was in un. Obviously, it's been rising before that, but when as soon as the healthcare bill comes through, the the prices suddenly start rising at a much higher slope than they were before, hmm. and. But I mean, much more important than I think the argument for economic efficiency is the the argument for morality. So the same with the transportation or, or this unionized kind of healthcare. Uh, I think it's instead you know because people who don't really get it from an economic standpoint or or may lose out in a free market you know who are kind of like oh like the doctors that have gone through twelve years of med school and then like oh wow a guy that's only had one year of training can now compete and make the same no I don't want that right no thank you but if we make the argument and the appeal to morality it's like are you okay with stealing money to you know to fund your lifestyle or yeah like like that's not right so um, but yeah I mean that argument is definitely there but I think it's more much more compelling well I agree with yeah. you and, and you look at it I mean not only from do you agree with stealing from these people it just just put it right in the face. Are you willing to say to somebody that went through 12 years of school to get their specialized degree, are you willing to look them in the eye and say, you owe me? All right. I am entitled to your services. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what? It's, it's enslavement. Yeah, it absolutely is enslavement. That's exactly what it is. And the right to uh, any of that stuff uh, necessarily uh, supports that. The right to food means you have to enslave someone to go out there and collect it, to uh, process it, to bag it, to transport it, to put it on the shelves. Yeah, the, 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 the liberal or the, the quote-unquote progressive Bill of Rights, that thing that FDR uh, decided to write in, in the uh, right to food, the right to health care, it's bullshit. That means you have the right to somebody else's stuff. Right. How can you tell me that? How can you tell me that you have the right to my labor? It... No. I'm ranting. No, no, no. So, Actually, so, a lot of this stuff you'll find, like, when people are like, well, where's an example of some of this occurred in which uh, it was practiced freely? You can look at friendly societies in the past when mass waves of immigrations, migrants came into the United States and 
uh, found it difficult to compete economically in, in terms of finding these services. So together they banded and created mutual aid societies and a lot of doctor services were very cheap. <laughs> and health insurance were very cheap and all this stuff. And it was all over the place, spread all across that. Yeah, you could have a lot more of those people that just wanted to help people. Right. And they could make a living wage at the same time doing it. Right. So. Right. Well, that's that's one of my uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes is actually from from somebody I absolutely can't stand. But this is a very good quote, a good point that he made is that uh, universal health care or universal services are basically insurance for assholes because you can you can treat your neighbors however badly you would like, yeah. and you're still taken care of. Hmm. But in if you don't have that, then you actually have to be a good neighbor. Right. And because you have to, you can't treat your, your friends like crap because eventually they'll say, you know what, I, I don't really feel like helping you out when you're, when you're in dire straits. All right. You're right. on your own. You're kind of a fuck up, man. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what ended up happening to that, uh, to the friendly society was, uh, was government. Government, the last thing government wanted was uh, independence in these communities that were uh, springing up all over the place. This is before Lyndon Johnson's, uh, you know, war on poverty. And so they sent in code enforcers. Well, that's not up to code. That building, that hospital, yeah, not up to inspection. Uh, you can you can threaten your your practice, uh, threatening doctors now. If well, that's where licenses, you know, lic licensing came in because uh, licensing actually came in because of doctors' unions complaining about not being paid enough. Right. And they said, okay, we need we need this to be we need to license people to protect against quacks or whatever. Okay, yeah, you know what. Maybe take care of your own stuff. Right. Don't don't pretend like you have the right for other people to keep you from getting conned. Right. You know, it's you need to do your own research, and w with licensing came this huge barrier to entry, right. which which screwed a lot of these friendly societies out of their doctors mm -hmm. because they were they were giving their their services for a discounted rate. That you know people in the ADA did wait no that's dental uh, <laughs> medical. AMA, um, medical yeah, I think you're right. But like people who who developed um, uh, societies like the AMA, they didn't approve of that. They didn't like you know having competition. Right, they the cartels, be, yeah, monopoly cartels. Right. Exactly. Pretty much anything has association at the name at the end of it. It's a cartel. Right. Like, uh, the veterinary association, the automobile association, uh, any association. Yeah, cartels are trying to prevent all the people from entering their government granted monopoly, mm -hmm. uh, like the taxi cab. You know, association. Yeah, this, I was actually thinking about the, the, the Uber versus the London taxi cab uh, union uh, when, when you brought this up. Uh, it's a very kind of sim similar situation where taxi cab drivers are complaining because they had to go through this strict licensing and they have to have like three years at least, you know, experience or something. You have to be able to, I don't know, something. Yeah, and the Uber drivers are just coming in taking over the markets. So. Right. Right. Yeah, that's happening in, uh, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. There's a huge deal in, in Portsmouth that ended up effectively outlawing Uber. It's yeah. not actually an outlawing, but it's basically outlawing Uber. And there's a lot, there are a lot of protesting, um, there, or there's a lot of protesting going on there, civil disobedience and, and things. Because, you know, the free staters are up there. But, um, but that's, you know, it's the same thing with the, with the taxi cabs against the, against the Uber drivers. Mm -hmm. It's just that, um, you have to, why aren't you hurting them just as much as you're hurting us? It's not that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be hurting us. You should be hurting them too. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, a lot, a lot of times there with uh, monopoly on roads, monopoly in the medical profession uh, on health. Uh, yeah. and it, this is, this is this, this is the type of thing that happens when you take away price signaling in the first place. Right. I mean, right. you have, so of course doctors go, are going to stand up against losing, you know, losing money. You know, what happens when you take away your price signaling, which is exactly what the healthcare system in, in, in uh, Great Britain did. They took away price signaling because they, they believe that healthcare should be free. So it's funded <laughs> through the centralized, you know, oh, a few geniuses at the top know where the money goes. We right. swear. Uh, obviously, it's uh, you know people are talking about sending literature to Oregon. People will be sending the literature of I Pencil by Lena Reed uh, to right. some of these people out there in England. Um, so. One person that thinks that they can create and control all this stuff. Yeah. And this, this is the, the the stupidest argument I ever hear from socialists and and atheist statists are oh the invisible hand proves that economics is voodoo or or, or religion or whatever. No, you. 
have you ever actually read economics? The invisible hand is just a term developed by the basically the founder of the field for something that he had not understood yet. And it was developed later into price theory. And there's an entire study on what's basically the invisible hand. It's price theory. It's just a term. It's all. It's not about God. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Expectations are too high, Phil. Yeah, that's why I like, yeah. I've tried the argument for economic efficiency a thousand times and it just never goes through. So just like, okay, would you would you forcefully steal money from me to fund your ideas and right. your lifestyle? And they're like, oh, well, then it kind of clicks. Let's cut the bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I tend to approach things more economically because that was kind of my route in. Right. Because I, I, I actually went through, uh, my journey was through economics first. And, right. and it wasn't until I was already a libertarian that, um, that I started... Identifying. You're a really smart guy, you know, mathematics and statistics, you know, that's, that's, yeah, I do, really I, understandable. I expect a lot more from the people I argue with than <laughs> I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to go to the next story. Uh, a lot more upsetting stuff from the government. Creepy Virginia toilet proposal could require general inspection, critics fear. It may be a new year, but the same old battle over bathrooms is starting all over again. A Republican lawmaker in Virginia is so concerned over which bathroom transgender people use, including children at school, that he is proposing a law that would fine them $50 each time they enter a restroom that doesn't match their anatomical sex. Yeah. So this is a House Bill 663. It's proposed by a political slave master ruler, Mark Cole, uh, from the State House of Representatives. And it defines anatomical sex as the physical condition of being male or female, which is determined by a person's anatomy. It would require all restrooms on property owned or leased by the state solely be used by individuals whose anatomical sex matches gender designation. And if it doesn't, you'll be fined $50, uh, which could be written by any police extortionist around the vicinity of these uh, unclaimed property. That's why the Republican yes. Party is just like, just dead, <laughs> so dead. I mean, I hate to talk about the, the land of the statism and, and that kind of illus illusion Well, world, they just can't but give up their... It's just, yeah. It, they, they can't give up things that are clearly politically destructive to their party. We're just fascinated with penises and vaginas. Right. It's like, what is wrong with this, this weird cult? Just, but, so now, you know, once this thing passes... Every time you go to a rest stop in Virginia, each bathroom door will have a cop there. But hold on, let let let. Okay, what you okay, got you're there? Good. Yeah, <laughs> before uh, they'll get some yeah. TSA inspectors. They well, don't even need that because they have infrared and all this kind of stuff where they can go through your house. Oh, you'll yeah. have to you'll have to do the the naked body body scan before the bathroom. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, it's TSA has already done their overreach. TSA is uh, outside of the Air Force now. They go to sports stadiums doing uh, checks. They go to uh, yeah. bus stations and stuff like that doing checks. I wouldn't uh, you know, put it past uh, them to do things like that already. I mean, they're already a uh, sexual molestation agency to begin with. You know, those would be your police extortionists to do this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so they say yeah, adults would be uh, required then, right? Yeah, they'd, have, they'd have to check it. How would you enforce this? How would you know? Uh, you don't have to... Is this going to go on in schools too? Yeah, school says, so yeah, of course. Wait. But so strangers are gonna be looking at your children's gym, right? So any any uh, government, uh, uh, they don't own property, but you know land that they prevent you from homesteading, uh, and they'll go there and check your children. Uh, I mean, there's already enough rape pedophiles and rapists in the public TSA. education system yeah. right. now. Like yeah. now you're just giving them like free range. You have the, well, the guy. I mean, we've already been doing that, like like you said with the TSA. I mean, have we not learned our lesson right. that the TSA? has an abnormally high rate of pedophiles mm. on their staff. Mm. You have that detective, uh, Albert, I believe, and Manassas police up there in Northern Virginia, who was <laughs> found out to be a pedophile and then shot himself when the cops were coming to, to arrest him. Uh, I covered that story uh, like a year and a half ago. Like, I put up a big chart, here's a pornography, child pornography ring in Manassas. And they took a picture of this kid's junk to kind of match the sexing that was going on. So they, they stripped him down and the guy was out there following him and taking pictures and Lo and behold, yeah, he himself was a pedophile. So who are you going to have uh, to check this, uh, these kids? Pedophiles like that guy. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, 
that, that's what you have in states. They don't know how to find solutions to any of these problems. You know, in, in the free market, you'll have, again, thousands of different areas that cater to your preferences and needs. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these places will look different from, I don't know, maybe the, the bathrooms of the future will look different. Maybe it'll be more like Starship Troopers and it was just unisex, you know. It's not that much uh, care, well, consideration, or shame, or body, but it'd be yeah, vastly different from uh, from what, what we have today. Well, that's the that's the the idiotic thing is that we have the exact opposite thing happening in other states. So, so you can't just say, all right, let folks just live the way they need to live. Right. But in, in you know, I, I think it's uh, I think it's St. Paul, Minnesota, or Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. I think they actually have required laws for private institutions to have unisex bathrooms. What kind of retarded laws are these? I mean, you're, you know, I understand the the, the idea behind it. You want to cater to transgender, and, and I I understand. You know, if if I had a business, I would say, hey, you know what, unisex bathrooms. We did, there's no sense in having one bathroom and, and you and I were talking about this earlier. You have a you have a woman's bathroom that has a line of people and then you have a male's yeah, like bathroom that's like a travel rest deep. stop, you know, I just yeah. something I noticed. Right, right, right. right. And this is this is a thing that happens. Why why do you have to force these decisions on on, on businesses? Right. And meanwhile in Virginia, you're not even you can't even have that. You have to fondle a kid a, a, a kid's junk before he takes a piss yeah. he or she because you're afraid that he might go into the wrong bathroom right yeah i think businesses don't really care so much look that, that's the last thing they want to worry about right, right. at a private enterprise like here's the washroom uh well, we, we offer washroom facilities go for it you know uh not so much to kind of dwell as much as uh this guy uh mark cole is doing because yeah now that's just more of a you know you should be assuming that this is a guy you have no problem then uh, molesting your children to make sure that uh, they're his ascribed sex or gender. Yeah, and, and to clarify, I mean, if you look at the if you look at the laws that are in in uh, Minneapolis, it, I th I think that's where they're. Don't quote me on that, but um, they have this requirement for unisex bathrooms. But a unisex bathroom in places like rest stops and things like that, that would be a perfectly fine solution to what he thinks apparently is a problem. Right. If you have a unisex bathroom, you know, and just closed off, um, closed off toilets or whatever, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about who's in what bathroom. Right. I don't think businesses really, really care much themselves. Like you right. go to cafes, they're not like looking to see whether or not you're going to the mail washroom or anything like that. Look, here's the hallway, yeah. so washing, knock yourself out. Yeah, as long as you're not harassing our customers. <clears throat> right. So it's a yeah, could you line. imagine, have you ever been to those rest stops where you have to go and get the key from like the yeah. weird, weird cashier? And he's like, hey, can I get the bathroom, sir? He's like, which key? I have to check you first. <laughs> Let me check you. <laughs> it's like, they don't it's care. Like, yeah. It's the law. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have to check you. Right? Yeah, but so they, they don't care. So look, <laughs> you used to wash you, I don't care. As long as you're buying something, right? And you're, you're, you're patronizing the business. That's all that really matters. The only thing that cares is like the color of your money. Bitcoin, right? hopefully. So um, but yeah, in, in terms of uh, government, I think the situation was arising through some kind of public school uh, situation. There was a kid who uh, describes her uh, as transgender. So... Um, he was, I uh, felt like being discriminated because there's no washroom there or where he's supposed to go and created this whole fiasco with the school policy and whatnot there. But of course, yeah, these are government schools. They're not run as business. They can't cater to people's needs and rise in demand of the market. Uh, so now you have uh, somebody like Mark Cole just going out there and just uh, creating an over blanket statement to affect uh, all over the tax from here and um, where we live. So yeah, that, it's not a market solution. And most businesses just don't care. Uh, well, I can guarantee you any time the solution is to fondle strangers junk, it's not a free market solution. That's not a free market solution. Yeah, right. No, absolutely. I can say that with relative confidence. Right. <laughs> uh, so there you have it. Uh, just a lot of uh, hate to stay stuff. You know, say it's not your friend. These, uh, this pedophile, Mark Cole, is not your friend. And that's something to kind of be wary of, you know, it's uh, you, you can't trust these people. These people have not been vetted. These people don't go through like the same kind of, um, uh, you know, you look at like a, even like cops right now, they're trying to say, well, that uh, they shouldn't be drug tested, but everyone else should be drug tested, you know, when you go, in, go into a work environment. Yeah, it's, it's, it's perfectly constitutional to take uh, mandatory blood drawing and drug tests of random people on the road. But it's unconstitutional to drug test cops. Yeah. The prison rules oh. don't apply to, to them at all. It applies to us as uh, prisoners and slaves. 
Uh, so that's, that's something to keep in mind as well. But uh, thank you so much for joining in on this. Uh, yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching. This is Cal Molone. John Howie. And Phil Paul. See you guys at the birthday party. Take good care. Left behind, dollar signs rule. But what about the fool who falls victim to the material world?